This morning, we're going to talk about a lesson I've entitled, Aquila and Priscilla, A Godly Marriage. And from the scripture reading that Josiah read for us this morning, if the title didn't give it away, what he read in Acts 18, 1 to 3 and Romans 16, 3 through 5, surely would. The focus this morning is going to be on Aquila and Priscilla. As many of you may know, this past weekend on Friday, the Burden family was joined together with the Riley family and marriage. And I've had the wedding on my brain for the last few weeks. And one of the things I was thinking about is we have some young people here that are considering entering into marriage. And I thought, what, would, what godly couple could we talk about that would kind of give them a, a role model to pattern their lives after? And I thought of Aquila and Priscilla near immediately and began reading the, the passages that we have of them. And they're, they're very few, but out of the few passages that we have of them, there's quite a bit that we can know about this godly couple. <clears throat> so we're going to be focusing our text this morning in Acts 18, 1 to 3, and looking at Romans 16, 3 through 5. But one of the things that I want to point out is that people regularly spend money, time, and resources on books seminars, and counseling to make their marriage work. People recognize the importance of a marriage that works. Now, they might have different goals, especially those in the world, but even those in the world recognize the importance of a marriage that is cohesive, that is a, one, is a unit that is more than just one flesh, but of one mind and one spirit and one purpose, right? So there are people that recognize the importance of a marriage that works. Christian couples need to be concerned that not only theirs is a marriage that works, but that their marriage works for the cause of Christ. Individually, we're to seek first the kingdom of God, Matthew 6, 33. But husbands and wives need to do this together to encourage one another, to put God first. Peter says husbands and wives are fellow heirs of the grace of life in 1 Peter 3, 7. So it's an important aspect of marriage that God be first. That if each husband and wife is putting God first, then God is before the marriage, and therefore all things ought to be done in a way that can be worked out. Elders and deacons, we're told in 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 13, and Titus 1, 6, that elders and deacons are to be family men, that they are to be good husbands and have good wives. Together, godly husbands and wives can be a force for good when they make their marriages work for the cause of Christ. And we're certainly going to see that in the example of Aquila and Priscilla. They were a married couple who set a godly example in making a marriage work for the Lord. They were ordinary people. Not one word says that they had spiritual gifts. There's not any passage that we can turn to that says Aquila held any offices in the church or that he was a preacher. They were ordinary people but they set different priorities than the world around them, and thus they stood out. They stood out to the Apostle Paul. They stood out to those in Corinth and Ephesus and even in Rome. And so we're going to talk about them this morning because in their brief appearance in the New Testament, they show saints today how to make a marriage work for the Lord. And so let's talk about this godly couple. Some of you might say, be saying this sounds familiar. We did talk about them about a little over four years ago. And I wanted to talk about them again as we have, again, some new faces, and we have people that are considering marriage right now. And so we need to talk about what a godly marriage looks like. Aquila and Priscilla, one of the first things I want to note about them is that they worked together. They are mentioned six times in the New Testament, and all six times they're mentioned, they are always mentioned together. I like to hear when people talk about us that it's not just Nate, but it's Nate and Becky. I like hearing our names together. We often, I remember when we lived with the Foys, we heard you mention Richard and Cindy. When you, Even if you were just talking about one of them, you would say you were with Richard and Cindy. I liked hearing that together because when we are married, we're no longer just a single unit. We are both. We are one flesh. We are one mind and one spirit and one purpose, or we ought to be. And so I like hearing the names mentioned together. And certainly as we look through the New Testament, we don't find Aquila and Priscilla ever mentioned separately. In fact, here in Acts 18 and verse 2, I'm just going to go through the six times that they are mentioned, and then we'll spend some time on Acts 18, 1 through 3. But it says in verse 2, And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And then in verse 18, 
Paul, having remained many days longer, took leave of the brethren and put out the sea for Syria, and with him were Priscilla and Aquila. In Sincrea he had his hair cut, for he was keeping a vow. And he began, and then verse 26, still speaking about Paul, it says he began speaking boldly in the synagogue, but when, oh, this is a, a Paulus coming to Corinth, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And we can also read there in 1 Corinthians 16, or in Romans 16, 3, Greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians 16, 19, The churches of Asia greet you. Aquila and Prisca greet you heartily in the Lord with the church that's in their house. And 2 Timothy 4, verse 19, Greet Prisca and Aquila in the household of Onesiphorus. Aquila and Priscilla are mentioned six times. They're always mentioned together. And only twice out of the six times is Aquila mentioned first. The other four times, as we just read, Priscilla, or Prisca as her name is also translated, she's mentioned, she's mentioned first. There are many speculations that abound as to why Priscilla might be mentioned first out of the, in four out of the six times. Uh, many different commentaries and even Bible dictionaries have a lot to say about that. And it's all speculation because we're not given the why. Perhaps to me, one of the best one is, is that looking at other ways that in the Hebrew and in the Greek, the way sometimes people are mentioned, is that usually the one who is the most outspoken or the spokesperson is often mentioned first. Peter is, in all, Peter is mentioned first in all the lists of the apostles. He is the most outspoken. There are times in the Old Testament where a person that does the most talking is mentioned first. So this seems to be a literary device of the Hebrew and even in the Greek. So it's possible that she was more talkative than Aquila was. And so she's mentioned first. I think that is the, the reason that I look at the most because we're not given a reason, but it also fits with other literary things that we can see in Hebrew and in Greek. We're not told the reason. And perhaps all it means is that Luke and Paul saw them equally important in the cause of Christ. For a marriage to work for, both, for the Lord, both spouses need to have the same mind. In Amos 3.3, an Old Testament passage, but it speaks volumes for uh, philosophy, it says two can't work together unless they are agreed. Amos was right then, he's still right today, right? You can't work together unless you are agreed. Luke eleven seven 7 says, Jesus said a house divided against itself cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, it will not stand. Not only did Jesus say it, but in our own country's history, Abraham Lincoln once said it, because of the Civil War and what happened. Four years of Civil War, devastation that split and fractured this country that for a lot of, in a lot of intents and purposes, those fractures are still there. A house divided against itself cannot stand. Acts 18, 2 through 3, we read there are both tent makers and they worked together. They worked in the business together, side by side, hand in hand, and then when Paul joined them as a tent maker as well, they joined forces with him. In 1 Corinthians 16, 19, they worked together in hosting the church in their house at Ephesus. In 1 Corinthians 16, 8, he mentions uh, that he's talking to them in Ephesus, that they were in Ephesus, and then he, they worked together hosting a house in their, uh, the church in their house, and at Rome, in Romans 16, Three through five, Paul says to greet them who have a church in their home. Romans 16, three through four, they not only work together to make ends meet as tent makers, but they shared in their spiritual goals as fellow workers with Paul. Then Paul says something interesting that I wish we had more detail on. He says that for the cause of Christ, they both risk their lives. They put their necks on the line for Paul and for the cause of Christ. I don't know what the details of that are. That's all Paul says about it. But obviously his readers at the time would have known the situation and understood the the gravity of it all. While we may not know the circumstances, we certainly understand when someone says they risk their life for me or they risk their life for somebody, we know that there was danger involved. They faced that danger together. Aquila and Priscilla worked together in making their marriage work for the Lord. In all things that we can read about them, they were in it together, even in danger, 
whether it's being hospitable and hosting the church in their home, working together to make ends meet as tent makers, or even in correcting error that they might encourage a young preacher to do better. We see them working together, side by side. Husbands and wives, we need to make sure that we are working together. We might have our separate hobbies and our separate interests, and we might do something separate, but when it comes to the big things, we need to be of one mind. We need to work together with our spouse that we might make our marriage work for the Lord. The second thing I want us to note about Aquila and Priscilla is they practiced hospitality. Here in Acts 18, 1 through 3, the first mention of this couple is they host Paul in their home, and they found they had some things in common with him. Let's read, starting in Acts 18, and read verse 1. And I truly want to thank Josiah. He tackled both of these texts with gusto, and I appreciate that. And ask you to turn again to Acts 18, verse 1. It says, After these things he left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. He came to them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they were working, for by trade they were tent makers. So we read in verses 1 through 3, <clears throat> one of the first things we, we note about them is that they're Jews, or at least Aquila is a Jew. Uh, it doesn't mention Priscilla, but it mentions Aquila as a Jew. They had been living in Rome, but Claudius had sent all the Jews packing, so they came here, they, and Paul found him in Corinth. And they took him in. And as they took him in, they found that they had some things in common. They and Paul were Jews in a foreign city. Neither of them called Corinth home. They were from Italy, forced to leave by decree of Emperor Claudius. They and Paul were both tent makers by trade. They got along so well with Paul that when he left Corinth, they left with him in verse 18. And then in verse 19, they stayed at Ephesus as Paul continued on. This hospitality, as well as the house of Titus Justice in Acts 18.7, and working with Paul, allowed Paul to support himself and not be accused of preaching for money, as he's later going to write to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 11, 5 to 9. And they not only opened their home up to Paul, but they hosted the church in their home in at least two locations that we, are, that we know of from the scriptures. In Romans 16, 3 through 5, turn over there. This is the passage that also says just briefly that they, they faced danger together. But it says in verse 3, as he's writing to the saints at Rome, he says, Greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who for my life risk their own necks, to whom not only do I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Also greet the church that is in their house. Greet Epinatus, my beloved, who is the first convert to Christ from Asia. So here in Romans 16, 3 through 5, there's a lot to unpack there that we don't know all the details, but one thing we do know is that they're still showing hospitality. The very first time they're introduced, they're showing hospitality to Paul. Now we find out they are, they've opened up their home. They've got, at some point in time, they've gone back to Rome, perhaps after Claudius' reign, but they've gone back to Rome, and they've opened up the church in their home there. And Paul says, greet them, and greet the church that meets with them. And I give them all thanks, because they risked their lives for me. And so he also greeted and thanked the churches among the Gentiles. So there must have been some collaboration with the churches there for their safety or Paul's or however it worked out, whatever the situation, Paul says they willingly went into danger on his behalf and he was thanking them. But they opened up their house to the church. We, we can understand what an hospitable undertaking that would be. To op for any of us to open up your home, what, husbands, what do you know your wives are going to be fretting about? That everything looks good. Maybe they're going to employ you to vacuum the carpet. You know, that's my job. <laughs> We'd be vacuuming. We'd be cleaning. There would be dusting. There would be all these things. And it would be done weekly because she wants to make sure the home is an inviting and warm place for the brethren to come into. And so we know that there, this hospitality, just mentioning that they hosted the church in their home, we know a lot of work and planning and preparation on both sides went into that. Even though we're not privy to the details, we know because if we did it, we know what would be involved, and so we can know what they 
possibly had in mind. They also hosted the church at Ephesus. At some point in time, in 1 Corinthians 16, 8, Paul is talking about uh, Ephes- being in Ephesus in 1 Corinthians 16, 8, and then in verse 19, he says to greet them and the church that is in their home. So we know from 2 Timothy 4, 19 and 1 Timothy 1, 3 that Timothy was in Ephesus. And so as he's opening up, let's turn to 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 8. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 8. We know that he left Timothy in uh, Ephesus. He says, but I will remain in Ephesus until Pentecost. So Paul is writing the Corinthian saints from Ephesus. So we know that from verse 8. He's staying in Ephesus. So then notice what he says in verse 19. He says, the churches of Asia greet you. So he's sending greetings from the people where he is at. He says, Aquila and Prisca greet you heartily in the Lord with the church that is in their house. All the brethren greet you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. So we know from 2 Timothy 4.19 and 1 Timothy 1.3 that he's going to leave Timothy in Ephesus when he leaves at Pentecost. So Timothy is the preacher there in Ephesus. And it makes you wonder, is Timothy preaching from the church that is in their house? When you make all those connections and connect the dots, it's fascinating to think about who all would have been there in Ephesus with them. But at some point in time, they're in Ephesus, and they open up their home to the church there as well. Saints are told to practice hospitality. Romans 12, 13, Hebrews 13, 2, we talked about this briefly in our adult class this morning, that we are told to practice hospitality, that people in in the past have done so and entertained angels without knowing it. That hospitality is an important part of being a saint. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 9 tells us to be hospitable to one another. We certainly see that hospitality in Aquila and Priscilla. And they are a godly example of doing just that. Not only taking in Paul, but then taking in all the brethren that had been converted in Ephesus and at Rome. Hospitality is from a Greek word, philonoxia, Strong's 5381. It means to entertain strangers. It means hospitality. It literally in the Greek means love of strangers. So when he tells us we are to show a love of strangers to one another and to strangers, we are to be hospitable. In ancient times, hospitality often including lodging and caring for one's needs. Those are things we still do for the brethren today. We can read Romans 12 and verse 13 and see that we are to, part of our function as men, many members of the same body is to show that kind of hospitality. So what we see in Aquila and Priscilla, they were godly examples of a hospitable couple in making their marriage work for the Lord. They often had brethren into their homes. Aquila and Priscilla, one of the last things I want us to look at is they supported preaching. And the only reason I'm bringing this up, because it is mentioned about them, is that it shows that God was their priority. That together they made a a conscientious decision and effort and a spending of their own resources and time to support the preaching of the gospel. At the heart of any couple wanting to make their marriage work for the Lord should be a love of the gospel and those who teach it. Gospel preachers or evangelists, and I'm not bringing this up to hoping for someone to open their doors to me. That's not why I'm saying this. You all have been very generous to me and my family. And many of you helped even go beyond and above supporting my work in Africa this last month. And so I am extremely blessed to be a member here with you. And I'm not mentioning this on any personal level. But that the scriptures point out that they supported preaching. And that couples today can still do that very same thing. That they can make a decision to support the preaching of the gospel. The New Testament records at least two preachers were the beneficiary of Aquila and Priscilla. First, the Apostle Paul. They took him in when he came to Corinth from Athens. They took him in in Acts 18, 1 to 3. In Romans 16, 3 through 5, he speaks highly of them as his fellow workers. He said in Romans 16, 4, they risked their own necks for his life. They exemplified the command to contributing to the needs of the saints 
practicing hospitality as we can read in Romans 12 and verse 13. I can't help but wonder, as he wrote to the saints at Rome, knowing that the church is in their home there, in Romans 12, 13, talking about contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality, it makes me wonder if he had them in mind as a great example of that. Because they certainly had showed that hospitality to him, the church at Ephesus, and now they're doing it in Rome as he writes the letter to the saints at Rome. And they showed great hospitality and care and concern for the preacher Apollos. Aquila and Priscilla met Apollos in Ephesus in Acts 18, 24 to 28. As Paul leaves Ephesus, they stay behind in Ephesus, and it's as Paul's on his way out, on his heels, comes in Apollos. He's mighty in the scriptures, we're told, but he has limited knowledge. He's talking about the, the baptism of John and hearing it. They don't embarrass him. They don't call out, boo, hiss. They wait till he's done. They take him aside and they said, hey, we need to tell you about Jesus. That's who John the Baptist pointed to. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And Apollos became even mightier in the scriptures because he listened to this godly couple. They saw he had great zeal, he had passion, but he was off in his teaching, so they took him aside privately and they corrected him. They met Apollos in a synagogue, showing their love for and concern of the gospel and those who would hear it. And in fact, Paul says, you don't have to take my word for it, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, 6, 16, 12, and Titus 3, 13, that Apollos became a great asset to Paul in preaching the gospel. How did he become that? Because this godly couple took it upon themselves to take him aside, both of them, and show him the way of God more accurately. What a blessing it is when couples who work for God can help support preachers in their preaching. One way we can make our marriages work is by making evangelism a priority in our families. Not just for the supporting of others, but supporting our children, helping them learn how to preach to others through Bible study and devotionals with our children. It takes, we need to take that time. Aquila and Priscilla were godly examples of supporting preaching efforts and making their marriage work for the Lord. Spouses married to non-Christians can still serve the Lord. Acts 16.1, we read that Timothy's mother was married to a Gentile, a Greek. She was a godly Jew. We don't know about him other than that he was a Greek. But they can still serve the Lord. 2 Timothy 1.5, 3.15, 1 Peter 3.1-2 all speak to this that says, maybe being a godly example to your spouse, you might even convert them for a marriage to truly work for the Lord. We're not only to be one flesh, Matthew 19.5, but to be of one mind, 1 Corinthians 1.10, Philippians 1.27, in spiritual things. A husband and wife don't just become one flesh. They need to become one in so many different areas of life. One of those is they need to become one in spiritual things, to have the same goals, to have the same purpose and priorities set. And that takes communication. Aquila and Priscilla set a godly example in showing us how to make a marriage work for the Lord by placing God first. Every time we read of them in the New Testament, all six times, they have put God first in some way or another through working together, through practicing hospitality, and supporting the preaching of the gospel. We see them have a marriage that works for the Lord. Husbands and wives, we can, we can look to this godly example and see how we can make our marriage work for the Lord. Young people who might be considering and thinking of marriage as you seek for that mate, make sure they are of the same mind and of the spiritual values that you hold. That you might, as you say your I do's, you might make your marriage work for the Lord. And this morning, if you're not a Christian, you need to take the first step to make a marriage work for the Lord by becoming a Christian. You can repent of your sins and be baptized into his name, knowing the Lord is ready to forgive you, the congregation is ready to forgive you, and that your name might be enrolled in the book of life, rising from the waters, a new creature, no longer living for your own desires, but the desires of him who died to save you. And this morning, if you are not living the way that you should, it just takes but to repent of your sins, 
to confess them and to pray for forgiveness. And if we can do that with you this morning, whether the waters of baptism or offer a prayer on your behalf, knowing that the prayers of the righteous accomplish much, come forward, let your request be known. While together we stand and sing.